What are the invisible forces that help us survive? From a split-second response when faced with danger, or a baby's inborn ability to reject potentially harmful food, to the huge risks we'll take when confronted by desperate situations. The answers lie deep within every single one of us. And they define what it is to be human. This is the story of our extraordinary instincts and why we behave the way we do. And our journey begins not here in our crowded modern world, but here in the vast wilderness of the African savannah. Because this is the landscape where early humans took their first footsteps and our instincts were forged. I want to explore what it means to be human because even after a lifetime studying the body, I only understand part of the human story. This is a pioneering journey. For the first time ever, we're beginning to comprehend the foundations of behavior, our human instincts. This is the story of the most basic instinct of all, the instinct to survive. We'll discover how every one of us possesses an armory of instincts to protect us from danger, even if we're barely aware of it. And the story begins at the moment of birth. Over the last 40 years, I've been present at literally thousands of births. And it's always an intensely moving experience to see the beginnings of life. But I don't think I've ever assisted at a delivery like this before. It's a boy, and an Aberdeen Angus. Like every living creature, he's born with a pre-programmed set of instincts. Some will only be revealed as he matures, but even at the moment of birth, they're all in place, waiting to be called upon to help him cope with the trials of life. This little chap is just two hours old, and he's not really standing up. He's actually walking around. He's actually on my foot at the moment. And all his survival instincts are intact. Now, by comparison, human babies at this stage are virtually useless. You look at the camera. Right? <laughs> Even at six months, these babies can't survive on their own. They can't even sit upright. Of all the mammals, we produce the most helpless of babies. And that's all because two million years ago, our early ancestors stood up and walked. As a result, the female pelvis grew narrower, but the human brain also grew significantly in size. So for a baby's big head to pass through a small birth canal, the baby has to be born well before the brain is fully developed. 
That evolutionary trade-off meant this. A highly vulnerable baby, born before its time. Wholly reliant on its parents. So how does a baby survive? It has one key instinct. To get noticed at all costs. Jasper is just a few weeks old. Like all newborn babies, he's using the one powerful weapon he has in his limited armory. He cries and he cries and he cries making sure the whole household is at the mercy of a bawling creature weighing less than a Christmas turkey. When he cries, to me, it means, Mum, come and get me, there's something wrong. Um, I need you now, and you just have to drop everything and go to him. Some people say, but how can you leave that? You can't. The instinct to cry is more sophisticated than you might think. Babies alter both the pitch and volume, depending on how urgent their need is for help. The louder and more piercing the scream, the quicker the response. I never ever imagined how loud a baby could scream. You read books, you hear about screaming babies, but until you've got one and it's there and it's in your ear, the sound is like nothing else. And there's a rule that unites all birds and mammals. The more needy the baby, the louder the sound it produces. When a human baby's cry is measured in decibels, the results are extraordinary. In fact, a baby's cry is just as hard to ignore as this pneumatic drill. Amazingly, Jasper's cry can match the air-splitting 97 decibels produced by the drill. Both are very insistent and both are very loud. A baby's cry is such a powerful tool for survival, it can even induce milk from its mother's breast. Essential when you haven't got much else going for you. Because from the moment we're born, it's the energy that food gives us that keeps us alive. Food is our fuel, and without it we die. But it's not just any food that we crave. Why is it we're all drawn to food like this, which is high in calories and fat? 1,000 billion eggs are produced worldwide every year. 600,000 tons of sugar are consumed each week. 800 tons of french fries are eaten every hour. And why? It's because our appetites were formed in a world where abundant food was simply unimaginable. millions of years, food of any sort was hard to come by. Our ancestors almost certainly fought hard for the calories that were so crucial to their survival. So those that craved food that was high in calories and rich in fat were more likely to survive. It was survival of the fattest. The instinct to lay down fat for lean times ahead made perfect sense in an unpredictable world. But why are those instincts still with us today? Let me show you something rather extraordinary. This ribbon is going to represent the amount of time that's passed since the human story really began. It starts here about four and a half million years ago when our first human ancestors were identified. And now, each stride I take will represent about a hundred thousand years. 
As I walk through time to the present day, I'm passing thousands of generations of early humans who struggled to survive in this barren landscape. Those of them who craved calorie-rich food lived and passed on their genes to their children. Those who didn't died. Gradually, over millions of years, that craving for calories became instinctive behavior, handed down from generation to generation, and it's still embedded in all of us today. And this flag, just 10 centimeters from the end of the ribbon, is the distance in time, 10,000 years, since humans first started cultivating crops. And the tip of my pencil, just here, is the last 100 years, when for some of us at least, food has been readily available and plentiful. So it's no surprise that the instincts which were forged so many millions of years ago have not yet caught up with the plenty that some humans are now fortunate enough to enjoy. I always thought that I craved fatty food like this because I was greedy. So it's a comfort to discover that I'm simply a product of millions of years of evolution, a descendant from a time when greed really was good. Delicious. The instinct to have the right type of food is very powerful. We know what to eat even in the most unfamiliar landscape. Ken Wilson's instincts to find nourishment were tested to the limit when a trip to Mexico went disastrously wrong. He was visiting a ruin in the jungle and took a wrong path, one that nearly led to his death. After days alone, Ken was desperately hungry. He was deep in the jungle, surrounded by unknown plants and animals, but he sensed which food would keep him alive. I was sort of looking for anything that might be of some nourishment and I saw this, this lizard. I was trying to decide if I was really that desperate or not, but I knew that I had to eat something. As I started putting in my mouth, he sprawled out his little legs in my throat and kind of made me gag and then pulled him back out. And I had to smack his head up against the tree a couple of times to make sure he was dead. And I swallowed him whole. But one small lizard didn't sustain Ken for long. And soon he was close to death. It had been 12, 13 days. I noticed there was vultures that started following me around. First few days, there was a couple there, and then there were a few more, a few more, and I began to wonder if maybe they knew something and I didn't. And that kind of gave me the creeps. And I would watch them circle overhead. And one day, the vultures were so close, they circled all the way down to the ground and I could actually hear the wind off their wings when they went by. I gave a, a lot of thought to dying after a while, but then again, I had to convince myself that I was perfectly capable of getting out of there on my own and I was gonna do it. Ken needed to find more food if he was going to live. I saw some fruit that was growing on a tree. As I bit into it, it didn't taste so bad at first. And as I started to chew it, it, it became very bitter. It had to taste a chemical taste like lighter fluid. It was awful. I was afraid that that was gonna be poison. The instinct to spit out the bitter tasting fruit may well have saved Ken's life. After 19 days in the jungle, Ken walked out alive. What helped Ken survive 
is a highly sophisticated piece of equipment. The human tongue has a number of uses, but its basic function is to tell us what's good for us and what could harm us. 5,000 taste buds let us know what to swallow and what to spit out. And to stay in perfect working order, taste buds only last 10 days before new ones develop. Our tongues are the gatekeepers to our stomachs. The way we interpret taste is a vital life-saving instinct and it's one that emerges at a remarkably young age. Foods that have lots of useful energy often taste sweet and sugary. And that's why babies instinctively like sweet foods. So let's see what happens when this baby tries this. A sweet and sugary concoction of banana puree. So try this. Go on. Yeah, it's very sweet. You like this, you like, you like it a lot. There, good boy. Do a bit more. It's sweet, isn't it? You want a bit more, of course. Naturally, these babies love it. It's just what their instincts ordered. Whereas a lot of toxic foods taste bitter. This pureed radicchio isn't actually toxic, but it tastes incredibly bitter, and our babies should find it instinctively well, yucky. <laughs> Wasn't my idea to give you this horrible food. <laughs> No one needs to teach these babies to avoid bitter food. One small taste is enough to activate the long evolved survival instinct. You've got all pink in the face. Look. I'm sorry, I don't want to do this. If it's yucky, it might be life threatening. So spit it out. Why? Oh, you don't like, oh, I'm sorry, you don't like it. Yeah, try a little bit. Well, you really like it. Yes? Yeah. It's not just babies that find bitter food disgusting, we all do. For our ancient ancestors, life was a constant struggle. And it wasn't just finding the right food to eat. Physical threats were everywhere. Here, our survival instincts were honed in an endless round of life and death dramas. These instincts are still deep within us today, and perhaps that's why at times we go looking for danger, to test them out. Pamplona, Spain. The place where danger is sought and survival instincts are put to the test. Every year, during the festival of San Fermin, people come from all over the world to run with the bulls. It's the ultimate adrenaline rush. Since the bull run began, hundreds of people have been horribly gored and many have lost their lives. Thousands invade Pamplona to experience the sheer thrill of facing death. This summer, firefighter Andy Minton is one of them. 
At home, I had a lot of friends tell me I'm crazy, but it's something I've always wanted to do ever since I was a teenager and finally put some money together and here it is. Hopefully it's a, uh, the first of many trips to Pamplona. And is agreed to take part in our experiment to see how the body responds at moments of acute danger, like being chased by six angry bulls. Okay, we got a, a heart rate monitor here. It's going to go around my torso. He'll be wired up to a whole variety of medical sensors. First, a heart rate monitor. This will relay information to a special watch he'll wear on his wrist. It's like it's fluctuating between 104 and 110. That's a little high. That's a little high. I can feel I can feel my heart beating beating in my chest right now. It's blood pressure cuff. It's gonna go on my left wrist. I'm gonna get a blood pressure reading right now. See how excited I am. About an hour and 15 minutes before the run. Got 159 over 112. So it's a little high already. Finally, I'm going to put a swab in my mouth. It's gonna measure the cortisol level. It's a stress hormone. The body chemical cortisol is closely associated with adrenaline. Adrenaline may save Andy's life, enabling him to run faster than he's ever done before. Now that Andy is rigged and ready, all he has to do is to wait. I feel excited. It's an hour before the run, and uh, we watch him erect the barriers. I'm ready to go. The possibility of death by a bull is, it's there, it's real, it's, uh, it's in the back of my mind. The bulls are released. And he waits for them to come near. In the tradition of the bull run, the challenge is to get as close to a charging bull as you dare, without getting gored. The bulls are just inches away, and Andy's body is flooded with a massive burst of adrenaline. His cortisol levels more than double. From a normal resting rate of 72 beats per minute, and his heart rate rockets, tripling to an amazing 230 beats per minute. Definitely in fear. You're, you're definitely in fear. It's, you can feel the stomp of the feet and the hooves and everything. It's wow. It's incredible. The fear instincts that we rely on to save our lives are immensely powerful. So it's very difficult to turn them off at will. Now I like to think of myself as a really rational human being. Bigger the risk will take, and taking the best rule possible to is part of our evolution or anything else. Heritage. And the longer we have, the bigger the difference to your life, the bigger the rule will take. America or in America, or our households with less than ten thousand dollars a year spend nearly three times as much on lottery tickets as richer families with fifty thousand dollars.